late as I basically did my homework on the bus, I'll have to cling much closer to my notes than the, the excellent speakers that came before me. Uh, bear with me. Um, personalization algorithms are often portrayed in a negative light, um, maybe especially so in German newspapers. Oh, sorry. <laughs> maybe especially so in German newspapers, but as the author of the Filter Bubble book is American, I think this might not just be a German problem. Basically, all those objections can be classified in two main categories. Um, that is A, the concept of personalization algorithms is okay, but all current implementations suck. Um, <coughs> Personal, personalization algorithms only supply us with more of what we already feel comfortable with. Uh, they will never confront us with anything new. Abuse and manipulation by companies or the government are too easy. Algorithms cater to the company's interests, not to the user's interests. And they're utterly intransparent, so we'll never know. All these problems, as far as they actually exist, which I think for some of them is true, for others not so much, could be fixed. This is different for the other sort of problems that belong to category B. All current implementations suck because the concept of personalization algorithms is wrong. It will either never work or it will work just fine and make us all miserable. Society will become increasingly fragmented when everyone lives in their own personalized information universe. Personalization will be the end of serendipity. The algorithms are inscrutable even to their developers or will become inscrutable tomorrow and will all be slaves to the machine. There are, of course, some problems with these objections. Um, there is no neutral arrangement of search results or recommendations or any kind of options. The designer or the developer always has to make a decision what to prioritize. And there is no consensus at all um, on which items are more important than others. Mark Zuckerberg is frequently quoted with this uh, squirrel comparison. A squirrel dying in your front yard may be more relevant to your interests right now than people dying in Africa. And when people hear this, they usually think, of course, people in Africa are more important. But it's not that easy. Are, what's more important, millions of war-related deaths in Africa or millions of traffic-related deaths somewhere else? What about a death in your family? What if the squirrel is only the first uh, victim of a squirrel flu pandemic that will kill us all? And another problem is what we choose to compare personalization with. One comparison is the old non-personalized internet that journalists often yearn for. But going back to that stage wouldn't help either. The non-personalized mainstream was just another filter bubble. And the only difference being that back then you were in a bubble you shared with quite a lot of others. Another comparison is the claim that human recommendations are a better fit than recommendations generated by machines. But Human recommendations can be very bad matches too. We like the social act of recommending, so, uh, recommending something or being on the receiving end of recommendations. And there is nothing wrong with the social interaction. It's fine if you like it, but we just shouldn't confuse it with the actual quality of the recommendation that's been given. And to the serendipity complaint, that say serendipity is everywhere, it's just that some people only make, if some people only make their <coughs> discoveries of new stuff outside the web, it is because they live their lives outside the web. They have all kinds of habits and infrastructure in their life for, uh, to, to promote those serendipitous discoveries, and, uh, like, for example, browsing bookstores. <coughs> you have to make an effort to do that. For example, leave your house once in a while, meet people, subscribe to a newspaper, and it's exactly the same on the web. The uh, author, Stephen Johnson, said that people who think the web is killing off serendipity are not using it correctly. I don't like the phrase using it correctly because I don't think there is a correct way of using it, but I think, I'd say they, those people are not making an effort, maybe they don't know how to. 
And probably the most important problem, there's a general lack of understanding as to how these algorithms actually work. For example, many algorithms do account for changing interests and preferences. To the algorithm, what you did last summer is, more, is uh, not as important, as not as relevant as what you did last week. And people don't usually know that and will write long newspaper articles about the evils of algorithms that will never show us anything new, that will render our world narrow and boring. And this is not the fault of the public. It's the fault of developers and designers. You can't simply assume that users will accept your authority or your algorithm's authority and believe that you know what is best for them. With the sole exception, I think, of Amazon, almost no one out there gives any kind of explanation of what their algorithms are doing, let alone give people an option to fine-tune the results. And even with Amazon, there is a lot of room for improvement. Which brings me to the questions of why are Personal, uh, personalization algorithms so unpopular. Apart from what I just said, that it is your own damn fault, I think it's mainly uh, three reasons. That is, A, we like to imagine ourselves as unique snowflakes. Oh, sorry, I forgot switching for you. <laughs> as unique snowflakes. We don't like to be confronted with the predictability of our preferences and desires, our similarity to other people. And B, there is a traditional belief that uh, there is an objective measure of quality and importance in instead of personal preferences. Belief that some tastes are better than others, especially if those tastes happen to be yours. And the uh, third uh, and last reason is that humans simply have different preferences. Some um, prefer algorithms because they think they will get more neutral results, some prefer human experts. And I think there is one aspect that is mostly missing from the debate. Uh, of course, it is true that companies want your personal data for simple money and advertising reasons. But that is not the only reason why personalization algorithms exist. These algori algori <laughs> sorry, algorithms are one possible solution for a very old problem. Uh, the problem of information overload. People have been complaining and thinking about this a lot longer than we usually realize. Uh, Vannevar Bush complained about it in 1945 when he wrote that we are bogged down by a growing mountain of research. The investigator is staggered by the findings and conclusions of thousands of other workers, conclusions which he cannot find time to grasp, much less to remember as they appear. And then 1680, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, who was already mentioned on the first talk, complained about the horrible mass of books that kept on, grow kept on growing. And as far back as 1545, the Swiss naturalist Konrad, Konrad Gessner wrote about the confusing and harmful abundance of books. There were several hundred thousands of scrolls in the Library of Alexandria, and I think it's safe to say that people probably were complaining even back then. So this is neither a new problem, nor is there a reason to believe that it will, will be solved in our lifetime, or for that matter, in anybody else's. But there is always some temporary relief. The printed encyclopedia was one coping strategy, so was the alphabetical index, dictionaries, all kinds of reference works. And re remember that all things had to be invented by someone. They weren't always there for us. Of course, there were problems with all of these solutions. Printed encyclopedias are expensive, they become obsolete quickly. The main problem is, after a while, all of these solutions are no longer as helpful as they used to be. Information overload comes back and it feels worse than ever. Some of you are old enough to remember the 1990s. You might even remember the world before Google. This was what it looked like. And while it was better than having no search engines at all, it wasn't very good. By the second half of the 90s, people were complaining a lot because with those early search engines and directories, results were pretty bad. And they were growing worse as the internet multiplied in size. And then came Google. The relief was huge. They had managed to solve the problem of bad search results with the help of an idea that had actually been around for a while. The scientists, if there are scientists among you, probably know the impact factor. 
I'm not going to go into the details now, but it was invented in the 1950s by a man called Eugene Garfield, who was trying to reduce information overload for scientists. The impact factor helps you identify some of the, mo some of the more important journals in your field and then only read those and disregard the rest. The idea, is the idea is fairly similar to Google's PageRank algorithm. In fact, several scientists had proposed what was almost exactly the Google algorithm as a solution to their problems with scientific publications as uh, far back as first in the 1950s and then again in 1976. But of course, the Google happiness didn't last either. The internet grew, and only a few short years later, people were complaining about information overload again. This problem will not go away. <coughs> Someone has to find a new temporary fix for this old problem. Personalization might be it, uh, that is, if it improves a lot over what we have today. But personalization is just one possible fix. There might be others. It might be worthwhile to think about those other possibilities. All these strategies cannot be scaled indef indefinitely. You can't simply have larger and larger encyclopedias or solve the problem with more alphabetical indexes or other kinds of indexes. The next step always comes from another uh, unforeseen direction that might be uh, at right angles to the existing strategies or be on a whole different level. And even if personalization is what we will go with, I, it is quite likely, I'd say, almost certain that after a while, it will itself become less and less helpful. We will realize that even if our new tools only serve as perfect results, the ones that are most relevant to our interests, even in this perfect world, there will be too much interesting, relevant, important stuff out there for us to ever make sense of it or, or feel comfortable with it. The alternatives to personalization, as well as the new temporary fix that will come after personalization has run its course, might already be out there. The Google PageRank algorithm had been out there for almost 50 years when Google started to use it. If you <coughs> manage to find this future concept, it might make you as rich as Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Start looking. Thank you.